Hey everybody and welcome back to my top 100 board games of all time. This is the 2022 into 2023 edition of the list and today I'll be continuing from number 60 down to number 51 and we are really in Euro country now. Now before I get started on the games I want to give a shout out to the show's sponsor Kienda. .co.uk, who are the best online retailer here in the UK. Got some fantastic games in stock, great discounts and loyalty schemes. And if you use my link in the show notes or the QR code, then you can get 5% off your first order. But let's get on with the games. At number 60, I have Ra. So Ra was actually ranked at number 95 last year. So it's had a real resurgence on this year's list. Now Ra is a classic bidding and auction style game by Dr. Rainer Knizia, as you are using these pre-allocated bidding tokens in order to acquire these tiles. And these tiles are gonna score you points in lots of different ways, um, such as having you know, a bunch of different buildings or not having the, uh, you know, the least amount of a certain type of tile or getting these um, Nile tiles, which will go hand in hand with these flood tiles and so on. But the way that you place these bids is so interesting because it has this kind of a bidding mechanism mixed with a pushy luck mechanism where every time you draw a tile from the back, you could be drawing a raw tile, which will instantly trigger an auction and put the tiles available up for, up for bids. But it'll also mean that the end of the round is gonna be drawing closer and closer to the conclusion. So it can extract this delicate balance of wanting to get all your bids in before the round ends, but not wanting to spend too much or not wanting to give your good big tile tokens up because if you do, they become vulnerable to be taken by other players. Just a very sophisticated and delicately balanced game. I think there's a lot of nuances here that start to unravel the more and more you play this one. And I just think it's kind of really stood the test of time for a reason. And this game goes back probably 25 years or so, and it is just absolutely fantastic still to this day. So that is Ra at number 60. At number 59, I have Nippon. Now Nippon is definitely a kind of quintessential Euro gamers game as you are vying for control of Japan. Um, but I love the fact in this game, you have to build up this infrastructure of these industries in order to place control markers down in the first place. And you're gonna do that by climbing tracks and you know, managing your income. And I love this kind of drafting system as whenever you want to take an action, you have to draft a meeple from that relevant action space and put it on your player board. And the idea of this is that all these meeples come in different colors and the more of the same color you collect, it means that you're gonna get kind of a more money in the future rounds or not have to spend bigger, kind of bigger fees and fines. So you have to kind of map things out carefully thinking, you know, I'm gonna do these actions because they have these meeples. I'm gonna prioritize these ones because I've got a feeling that the other players are gonna want them. Um, maybe I'm gonna divert a little bit to take this action, even though it's not the meeple I ideally want and so on. And I also love this pressure of when it comes to consolidating, i.e. you know, getting your or paying those fees for the different meeples, you're gonna lose any money left in your supply and then restock from there. So you can't really carry money through one round into the next one, meaning you have to be again, very careful to be efficient. And I think efficiency is one of the best ways to kind of define this game. Um, lots going on here, but again, if you like titles by Watch Your Game, then um, Nippon is definitely up there with the best of them. So that is Nippon at number 59. At number 58, I have St. Petersburg. So St. Petersburg really does have this throwback feel of an engine building game. So what you're doing in this game is you're collecting cards from these different decks. And the only real two currencies in this game are money and victory points. And you're gonna be basically using money to buy new cards, which will hopefully get you more money, and use that money to buy new cards, which will give you victory points, and so on. But the cool thing about this game is the tempo and the way that things progress because basically as the game goes on, you're gonna be drawing cards from these different decks and spending your money to acquire new cards. But the trick of this game is that those cards will only pay out when it comes to certain phases in the game, meaning that you need to pace yourself quite carefully because if you get too sucked up in a certain um, kind of phase in the game and you end up spending all your money, you're not gonna be able to do anything for the remainder of that round until all those cards pay out again. So again, I love that kind of, you know, sitting back sometimes and thinking, let's pace myself here, let's keep some money back because maybe there'll be a better card available to me later than there is right now, even though these ones are really good. There's some cool little tricks as well you can add in by adding expansion material in just to spice the game up a little bit, but I do love that kind of core boiled down energy building nature of this game. And again, criminally, um, it's just such a shame I should say that this game isn't widely available. It is out of print, very hard to come by, but if you can find a copy, I highly recommend you pick one up. That is St. Petersburg at number 58. At number 57, I have the second game that's actually climbed 
a few spots because this was ranked at number 60 last year. This is Ys. So Ys is another relatively unknown game by publisher Istari Games, who used to make some fantastic Euro designs. Um, and this one was one of them. So Ys is a real nifty game, um, another kind of blind bidding auction style game as you are trying to control these regions by placing these kind of bidding cylinders down, these different values on them. Some of these cylinders you're placing face up in order to show the value to other players, but some of them you can play face down. So you can kind of lure your opponents to thinking that you're bidding a lot for a certain region, when in reality you might be bidding very little and vice versa. You're trying to control these regions and then regions within those regions in order to get these gems. And these gems are going to get you points based on the shifting commodity speculation mechanism. Um, and you're also trying to collect these unique powers. You're trying to collect these black gems, which will score you points on a sliding scale. And yeah, I just love the way everything comes together here. I love the way the initiative order works because you can use the cylinders that you're not using to place on the board to determine that player order and so on. And you can even give up these cylinders for end game scoring, which can, you know, I love that kind of thought of short term decisions versus long term gains. So yeah, a wonderful little cohesive game, one that I think is still available out there, criminally underrated. And I mean that in the kind of the raw sense, really. Nobody talks about this game and it is up there with a the kind of classic Euro. You know, this is my 57th best game of all time. And it's a game that nobody knows about. That is East at number 57. At number 56, I have Signorie, which is the second game published by Watch Your Game on this particular video, and the first one being Nippon, of course. So Signorie is another medium heavyweight Euro, and the key mechanisms in this one are dice drafting and engine building. And the idea is that you are the patriarch of this kind of wealthy Italian noble family. You're trying to marry your daughters off to different noble families and collect their sigils and get points that way. And you're also trying to send your sons off to the different kind of you know, noble disciplines such as you know, military and you know, royal family and all that kind of stuff. But it's all very Euro in its nature. But I love this dice drafting mechanism in this game where drafting high value dice is great because it means you get discounts in terms of the coins you're gonna pay because you know you do have to pay money when you draft dice. Uh, but it means that you also want to draft lower value dice because having low value dice when your total cumulative value is below a certain threshold, you get access to quite a powerful bonus and you want to be making sure that you get those bonuses to get a leg up on your opponents. So yeah, I love that decision of, you know, I, I need my money, but maybe I brought on this power, which one is more important and so on. And there's also some huge potential to build up your player board to keep on getting um, you know, rewarded or repeated benefits through your engine and keep getting better and better. So it really does have that cool crescendo of making you more powerful as the game goes on, which is always a good thing for me. So that is Signorie at number 56. At number 55, I have The Estates. So I always say The Estates is one of the most polarizing games I have in my collection. Definitely one of the most confrontational and in your face and even downright nasty games that I own. So this is a bidding style game as you are you know, trying to auction off these different pieces to contribute to these skyscrapers on these three different rows, which are basically determine these plots of lands that you can build on. Now, when you build certain types of bricks on, on these columns of these skyscrapers and you're the first to do so, then you're going to take control of those companies and have a vested interest in those companies. And then as the game develops, you are trying to build these blocks on top of each other, bearing in mind that lower numbers can only go on higher numbers. So there's a little restriction there and you can end up capping these buildings off by putting the roofs on them. Um, but the trick is that as soon as two out of three of these columns is resolved, then it's going to be end game scoring. And the one that isn't resolved is going to score you negative points. So you're kind of thinking if people are contributing a lot of their efforts to a certain row, you can make sure that that row doesn't get completed and tank their points completely. And you can do that in some quite nasty ways by extending the boundary of those regions and pushing it further and further along, making sure that they have no chance at all to finish that row, which of course is gonna result them in getting negative points. But it's all about how you manage your money. And this is a closed economy game. So there's never any new money entering into the system. If you're buying an item of someone else, they're getting that money and they will use it against you. So it adds a lot of pressure with every single kind of penny that you spend. And I love that consequence of your decisions in this one. And it's just a, you know, a, a very meaty game. Every decision matters in, su in such a concise game as well, because this only does take around 30 minutes to play, maybe a little bit longer, but it just, oh, it's so satisfying when it, everything 
kind of goes in your direction, but be prepared for it to go wrong and um, be prepared to end up in negative points. At number 54, I have Firenze, which was actually number 50 last year, so a very minor fall there. And if anything, that's probably um, some praise for this game because it's very hard to hold your own on these lists when I play so many games each year. And it goes to show how solid this design by Andreas Stelling is. So Firenze is a tower building style game as you're collecting these blocks of different colors. And when you reach certain levels of these blocks, you can cash them in to put your marker down on the board to show that you've built that tower and you'll get the according amount of points. But there's always this pressure in this game as if you don't keep adding on to your existing towers, then they will half in value. So you have this constant pressure of having to add on to them each time. The more built blocks you add on to your towers each, each round will cost you more and more money. So you ought to be fast, but being fast is gonna be costly. And it all works through this drafting system as you are acquiring these cards from this row, which will give you kind of engine building benefits, they'll give you little one-off abilities and so on. But also those cards tie hand in hand with the blocks you actually collect because they're gonna be distributed onto them at random. And some of these cards are actually pretty rubbish and you do not want them at all. However, whenever you take cards from this row, every one you skip past, you have to deposit a tile on it or a brick on it, meaning that even the rubbish ones right at the start will end up accumulating more and more and more bricks on them, where eventually someone's gonna think, you know what, this card is rubbish, I really don't want it, but look at all these bricks I'm guessing, I can build so much with these. And I love that mechanism, and I think Firenze might be the strongest example of that, I call it incentive building mechanism where yeah, things get better and better and more inviting as the game goes on. And finally, there'll be that kind of straw that breaks the camel's back and think, you know what, I'm going to take it. And yeah, Frenzy does that wonderfully. Um, so that is Firenze at number 54. At number 53, I have Kalis. So Kalis is a bit of an anomaly for me, actually, because generally these resource collecting worker placement games are a bit kind of flatlined for me now. There's so many of them out there and they all feel like they're carbon copies of one another. Now, Kalis, ironically, is one of the first ones ever released, and for me, it's still probably the best one. So this is one of those games where you're placing workers down, collecting resources, trading these resources in to get victory points by contributing to the church in, in this game. But it has that mechanism where you can build new buildings and place them on empty spots, meaning that when other people go there, you will get a reward for doing so. So all standard stuff, you know, on the face of it. But there's just little twists and little design elements to this game that make it feel special to me. Like, for example, if you end up passing, um, then every player still in the round has to end up spending more and more money to stay in the game. Or it has this quite a nifty provost mechanism where there's this neutral piece on the board and it, stand, it sits somewhere on the road and then players can actually manipulate where that provost is going to move. And that's very important because every building that comes after that provost is going to be completely void. And bearing in mind that that provost moves after all the deployments, it means that if you're placing your workers kind of in a risky area near the provost, it means that you're vulnerable to be messed around with by the other players and could have wasted that whole deployment. So yeah, just those little things that make this feel, game feel special. It's got some cool buildings. It has this constant kind of um, amplifying effect where you keep getting better and better buildings out there, more inviting ones. And it's just a very well ironed out game. Um, almost I can't think of any way that this game could be improved. And you know, considering, as I said, there are so many games out there that have tried to um, you know, replicate how Kalis works. I don't think any of them have done it as well. So that is Kalis at number 53. At number 52, I have Rococo. So Rococo is a gorgeous game about trying to collect resources, such as you know, threads and materials, and then build these gowns for this rich nobility, and then send that nobility off to the different dancing halls in order to score area control bonuses. Um, so pretty standard stuff in terms of how you're scoring points here. But what I love about this game is the hand management and the card play that entails. So basically, whenever you take an action, you have to give up a card. And these cards are gonna come in three different categories. You've got like your apprentices, you've got your journeymen, and you've got the masters as well. And depending on the category, it's gonna allow you access to different actions. But also each of those cards is gonna have a unique ability assigned to it, which can really affect how you do things. So you might think, you know what, I really need the bottom card of this one here. Um, and get the benefit for that. 
So therefore I will use this action to do this, and then maybe I'll use this card in a minute to do this, and so on. And there's good competition to get into these halls because they're quite tight, and you're trying to get these kind of multipliers by putting these fireworks displays on. And it's just a lovely, vivid game, a very vibrant in the way it looks, especially if you've got the Eagle Griffin design. They're very expensive, but definitely um, a, you know, a wonderful production, and it has certainly a spectacle element to it and again another cohesive classic feeling euro where there really isn't much margin for improvement so that is rococo at number 52 and the final game at this video at number 51 i have to kenyu obelisk of the sun this is actually the second dice drafting game uh, on this list because dice drafting in general is a mechanism i love and spoiler alert you will be seeing more of them in upcoming videos. But I'm always fascinated about how Daniele Toshini uses dice drafting and incorporates new innovative ideas. And the idea in this one is quite interesting because you have this physical obelisk structure which will rotate as the game goes on, which will impact on the dice available for drafting because these dra dice are gonna come in different colors and depending on the position of the obelisk is going to determine if those dice sit in the shadow, the shade, or the light. And that's important because you have scales on your player board. And when you draft these different dice, they sit on either the light area or the dark area. And it means that you, know, you wanna keep them as balanced as possible because if you go too far in balance, you're gonna end up costing you negative points, which is obviously not good. So I love that extra decision on wanting to you know, take the actions that you want. And on top of that, you are trying to collect these cards, which give you kind of engine building benefits. You're trying to um, build these structures and things to get points in lots of different ways. In a very mechanical game. And to be honest, I had a bit of a roller coaster with uh, kind of experience with this game where when I first played it, it wasn't gelling with me so well. When I played it more and more, it was really starting to click. Um, and I started, you know, I ended up loving it. So it's definitely one of those games I think that rewards repeated plays. And the more you get these um, kind of admin systems out your out your system, you know, by allocating the dice, etc., um, it starts to work quite smoothly. And there's definitely a depth and rich experience there when it comes to you know the Euro game nature of it. So that is to Ken you Obelisk of the Sun at number fifty one. So there we have it, that's another 10 games. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please be sure to hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other content too. And hopefully you'll join me for the remainder of the list where we get into the top half and really start busting into that top 50. So for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye-bye.